Uh, our next talk is uh, Greg Yang from X, uh, no, XAI. XAI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, well, we've got his title up there: the unreasonable <laughs> effectiveness of nonlinear random matrix theory and artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jamie, and the organizers for having me here. Um, so I guess most of you probably have already used uh, ChatGPT at uh, some point in the past year. And we've just released uh, Grok. Uh, and all these um, amazing uh, tools today of uh, AI uh, are formed from neural networks. So maybe a, a small show of hands, like who has not seen a neural network before? Oh, wow, okay. Well, that's surprisingly many people that uh, have seen neural networks. <clears throat> okay, so uh, maybe like just for the two or three people who, who show hands, I'm gonna just review what a neural network is. So, you know, this is like a pretty typical uh, pictorial representation of a neural network. So you have a you know, bunch of uh, neurons and a bunch of layers, each, each uh, blue slice is uh, what's called a layer. The one in the middle is called the hidden layer. And then there's the input and output layers. And then the, the little circles in each layer represents a neuron. Uh, and the way the signal propagates through a neural network is, it, you know, you, you feed in, say, an image in the input side. So that's like analogous to, you know, a signal coming in through our vision, our, our, our eyes. And <clears throat> the, the input neurons light up, you know, with some numbers, say like one, three, and negative two. Um, and uh, and uh, between layers, there are connections. And these connections have strings associated with them. So for example, uh, this connection has string two. That means that you know, when this neuron fires, uh, the, the, the target neuron is uh, positively excited. And this one is has strength negative four, which means that when you know the input neuron gets excited, uh, the the target neuron gets negatively excited or suppressed. Um, and the, the the mathematically the way uh, a neural network operates is you have uh, uh, a you calculate the linear combination uh, of the input neurons uh, with the weights given by the uh, the connections. And that, that gives you what's called the pre-activation. So this is just a linear combination of the input neuron values with the, with the weight values, the connection values that produces number. And then you pass it through what's called an activation function, which you know, a lot of times is like a squashing function, like a sigmoidal function that looks like this. Uh, and then you, know, you, so you pass this and you get a number back, okay? Um, so you know, for example, like, when you do this calculation uh, from the input layer to the hidden layer, you might get a set of numbers like this um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's always, a neural network is always uh, uh, a interleaving of uh, linear operations and nonlinear operations. So two uh, notions of size that are very important in discussion of neural networks. One is the width uh, of the network, which is number neurons in the hidden layer. Okay, so here it is four, there are four neurons. The second notion is depth, which is number of layers. Uh, and here you can count it as three layers or one hidden layer and so on and so forth. So they're like kind of you know, roughly similar ways of counting the number of layers. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a very quick uh, and an intuitive picture of what a neural network looks like is, you know, obviously inspired by uh, animal neural systems. Uh, but mathematically, it's more convenient to represent this using matrix notation. So in matrix notation, you know, the, the input, uh, the set of input values, it will be represented by a vector of length three. And uh, the weight, the connections, where the weights are represented by matrices. So here is a four by three matrix because it connects a input vector of length three to an uh, output vector of length four. And the, the pre-activation is just a matrix publication. So we write here, uh, pre-activation is H1, and this equals W1 times X0. 
which is a straightforward matrix of application. And then in, in deep learning, uh, we often use this entry-wise notation of function application. So here we write x1, the, the activation, equals phi of h1. Phi is a uh, scalar function from r to r. But here, when you apply it to vector, it's applied entry-wise. Right, so, so this just says that x1 is the result of applying phi to every entry of h1. And then, uh, similarly, you know, you can denote the second layer of weights by W2, and then you get a matrix of location, and that's the output of the network. So you could write the phi is the That's right, exactly. So what you have there is a battery diagram. Uh, what, what diagram? <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, if you have one I see. So indeed, you can repeat this construction, and a you know a, a, an L layer new network will look like this, right? So you interleave multiplication with matrices with entry-wise nonlinearities, um, and in a cleaner vector uh, notation, we can represent it using this kind of picture. So you have an input vector, you pass it through a weight matrix, which is just a matrix of multiplication. And then after that, you pass it through a entry-wise nonlinearity, and then you just repeat this, right? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, here it is. You can vary it in real life, but uh, for simplicity, it just assumes the same. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, but you can absorb it into the weights. So just to keep it simple, I just assume this is the form of the new network. Yeah, it's, it's bias, like, you know, to be honest, like nowadays in large language models, we don't even use biases. Um, okay, so, so based on the uh, uh, example so far, we can observe that the new network uh, I presented here our basic composition of two building blocks. I've repeated this a couple times already, but it's a composition of matrix publication and corner-wise nonlinearities. Okay, and in fact, you know, if you zoom out and you 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 uh, look at things more a bit more carefully, it is still true that everything in deep learning, so all neural network computations are composition of these two things, which can be a very trivial statement or cannot be a very trivial statement depending on depending on where you're coming from. But such a uh, composition of matrix publication and quantized nonlinearity is called the tensor program. Okay, so now you know we're in a well, like free probability random matrix uh, workshop. So a very natural question to ask is how does a random neural network behave? So by random here I mean like sample the weights uh, in ID fashion. Okay, so the key claim I'm going to make is that. When you sample the weights with ID entries, then all the pre and post activation vectors in the neural network will have approximately ID entries as the width goes to infinity. Okay, so let's look at why this should be the case. So again, when I say you know sampling the weights in ID fashion, I mean like W1 here, W2 here, they're gonna have you know say ID Gaussian entries or something like that. Okay, the the nonlinearity here are like not touched. It's just some function, you know, like square if you want, or sigmoid, anything. Okay, so let's look at, you know, what happens in this network when uh, the, the width is large and um, the, the weights have random ID entries. First of all, the input is deterministic. You just think of input as like a picture of a cat or something like that. It's just something that's given. Okay, so there's no randomness associated here. Next, you're multiplying this vector, deterministic vector, by an ID random matrix. So, you know, just by a very elementary calculation, you can see that this first pre-activation vector, the screen vector, is going to be ID, have ID entries, okay? 
So this is entirely elementary, very trivial so far. Okay, so this is the base case. Next, let's look at the first uh, nonlinearity application. So here we're mapping uh, uh, this uh, every entry of this green vector through this nonlinearity phi. Okay, so you get this blue vector, and here again it's very trivial because you know like we already said that the green vector every entry is ID. So we map each of them through the same function then the resulting function, uh, the resulting vector, of course, still has ID entries. It's just the distribution now changed uh, under a push forward uh, of phi. Okay, so still the vector, this blue vector has roughly ID entries. Okay, now the next one is a slightly non-trivial, but still pretty easy. So, so now the observation is that, you know, you have this vector here, which is ID random, this blue vector here, and you're multiplying it by W2, this matrix. And you, you can observe that by construction, W2 has uh, independent entries from this blue vector. They're independent, okay? So in this situation, you know, we can do some elementary calculation. So let's abstract this into, you know, maybe a general phenomenon. So suppose we have a, a vector V in Rn, so an n-dimensional vector, and W is an n by n matrix, which is independent from V. And let's suppose we sample it uh, as a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one over n, then observe that when you condition on v, uh, wv has id entries, each with the uh, distribution, which is a Gaussian with zero mean and variance a norm of v squared divided by n. Okay, so when you condition on v, like this entry is deterministic, so uh, every entry of w times v is literally id. Uh, with this distribution, okay? Now, finally, observe that if you have that this, uh, you know, if you un undo the conditioning, and you now, if you had the fact that uh, the norm, the normalized norm squared of V converges to one, or say some other deterministic number, then WV has ID, you know, standard Gaussian entries unconditionally in this limit. Okay, so again, the reasoning here is that when we condition on the input vector, you have ID entries. Um, but when you do, when you, in general, when you undo the conditioning, that's not no longer true. But it is true if the, the norm of the input vector converges deterministically, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and like, so this kind of deterministic convergence would be the case if you know, like in the example we just saw, V has ID entries from a distribution uh, where the second moment is one, right? And then by low large numbers, you have this almost surely. And of course, we can replace a one here with anything, any constant that's deterministic. Yep. Sure. Sure. Oh, it is relevant when you, when you start doing induction, right? So the the thing so uh, here, yeah, what you're saying is correct. You don't you don't need the ID ness. You just need the convergence to one, but but. To get this convergence one, we need to use the ID fact. We, so you will see in a second. When you start doing the induction, it'll be very clear, like you know, why this is a very, very useful fact. Um, so, so using uh, this deduction here, we can see that you know, again, the situation is that we're multiplying this blue vector, which is which has roughly uh, ID entries. We ha we ha sorry, exactly ID entries, multiplying by independent matrix W two. So as a result, you can say that the resulting, the screen vector here has, has roughly ID Gaussian entries. So maybe let me come back to your question now. So the reason the, the ID-ness is important is because this fee, this entry-wise application fee forces you to have a preferred basis. 
you cannot, you, you, this, this operation, this composition operation is not basis independent. When you apply phi, you're forcing, you're, you're automatically preferring the natural basis. And this is why the perspective IED-ness really helps, which is, this is very, something very, very different from, you know, like a traditional random matrix or free probability perspective. Here, you really have a preferred basis. And you wanna keep this in mind when you do induction. Okay, so anyway, um, you know, back to this picture. So after this step of reasoning, we now see that the screen vector has roughly ID uh, entries. So then you can just repeat you know, the reasoning before, you pass it through an entry-wise nonlinearity, and the resulting uh, vector uh, still has roughly ID entries, albeit with a, a bit different distribution. And then you can just repeat this reasoning uh, of you know, uh, the entry-wise nonlinearity and multiplication by uh, independent uh, random ID matrix. And eventually you'll see that the output vector of the, of the network will also look like ID Gaussians, okay? So um, this is you know, pretty much the main step, uh, sequence of reasoning to arrive at what the so-called neural network Gaussian process correspondence, which I won't talk about very much, just kind of leave you a note here that uh, this is a very famous uh, result on uh, why neural networks, why neural networks are with random weights. Uh, as a random function is distributed as a Gaussian process as with Gaussian infinity. So again, this is just a very um, standard result in this area uh, where, you know, you have this like a priori very complicated function, you know, given by a neural network, but somehow when you randomly sample the weights and let the width go to infinity, the, the function, the random function becomes a very, you know, well distributed, uh, well studied object. Okay, so this is, so, so far we cover kind of the easiest case of, you know, what happens in a computation that's a composition of, you know, random matrix multiplication and nonlinearities. And what was, what was really helpful here is that, you know, the W1 and W2, so on and so forth, they're independent uh, from in previous uh, vectors. So the natural next question to ask is, what if, the weights are no longer independent, but you, you, you reused the weights somehow. So the simplest case here is, you know, suppose instead of W2 being randomly sampled uh, independently from W1, we just set W2 to be equal W1 transpose, okay? This is the simplest case where you have, you know, correlations between the weights. Okay, so let's, to give you some intuition, let's uh, do some calculation here. So again, I'm gonna abstract this situation into this uh, simpler, cleaner setup. So now suppose uh, almost the same as before, we have V being an n-dimensional vector, W being a n by n square matrix with entries, you know, sample from a Gaussian with variance one over n. But now instead of V being independent from W, we let V equals uh, phi applied to W transpose times U, where U is independent from W. Right, so again, previously V is independent from W, and we see that the resulting matrix multiplication has a Gaussian structure. Uh, now we, we take one small step into introducing correlation between V and W, uh, and this, this is the form of V equals, you know, some nonlinearity apply entry-wise to W transpose times U. Times U. Right, so W applies both, uh, W appears both inside of V and in the matrix multiplication. Okay, so let's do some uh, you know, intuitive calculation to see what's going on here. First, I'm gonna let uh, just notation, I'm gonna set H to be W transpose times U. Okay, so let's now do some calculations. Let's look at the alpha entry of W times V, right? So this W times this V, right? So uh, this is entirely trivial, you know, algebra here. So I'm just writing this out. So the Alpha the entry is equal to sum over beta of W uh, alpha beta times phi of H beta, which expands to this. So this is just all unrolling a definition. Okay, so now notice that inside the sum, uh, I, I'm summing over gamma, index gamma. And the first thing I'm gonna do is separate out the sum into a leading term and a subleading term. 
So I'm going to split this h beta into a h hat, which is the sum uh, excluding this term of uh, gamma equals uh, alpha. So I'm, I'm splitting the sum of over gamma into a gamma not equal to alpha term and a gamma equals alpha term. So this is the gamma equals alpha term. It's w alpha beta times u alpha. And it's a very, very small term. Okay, so like the h beta is mostly h hat beta plus this term that's like on the scale one over square root of n. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm gonna do some Taylor expansion. So you know, assume phi is smooth enough. Uh, and then you can expand around h beta. And then you get this kind of Taylor expansion. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna collect the terms. So ignoring the lower ordering, uh, lower order terms, uh, I'm gonna put this term here, collecting w alpha beta with w alpha beta here. So we get this, this thing here on the left, which is uh, you know, a, a u alpha times the sum of some phi prime blah, blah, blah. And then this term I'm gonna collect here. So finally, let's like zoom out a little bit and see what's going on here. So on the left, uh, the this, this sum here, sum over beta, you can see that essentially what happens here is a low large number behavior where w squared alpha beta has mean one over n. And all the fluctuations around this mean will vanish as n goes to infinity. So we essentially just get uh, a con the sum will, will converge to a constant c, where c is this limit uh, of the average of p prime of h beta, which is almost the same as h hat beta. Okay. So, um, so that's the first term, and the second term is very similar to before, but now the 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 key difference is that you know instead of you having h beta here, you have h hat beta here which is independent from W alpha beta. So now this, this sum is almost the same as what we saw in the previous uh, uncorrelated matrix multiplication, where you multiply a matrix by an independent vector. This is very similar. So uh, as a result, you're gonna get a, a Gaussian term here uh, of variance being the norm square root of V divided by N, okay? So again, summarizing the situation at hand, when you undo this you know, index by alpha, you just, what you see is that W times V, where V is just now a correlated term, correlated to W, is now a, a multiple of U, the U is inside here. It's a multiple of U plus a Gaussian term. And this Gaussian term just looks like what you would calculate uh, if W and V are independent. Okay, so, but the conclusion here is still that you can see that the form here tells you that W times V remains approximately ID because you know, the, the, for the Gaussian term is obviously true. And then for C times U, uh, if U is approximately ID, then this uh, C times U will remain roughly ID, okay? So as a result of this um, short calculation, you can see that even if W2 is W1 transpose, the um, when you when you uh, when your reasoning comes to this step of matrix multiplication of W two by this blue vector, the resulting green vector is still going to be roughly ID. Okay, so the, the same inductive reasoning still holds, and you can see that like you know the output vector will be roughly ID. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a taste of um, kind of what happens. Uh, in, in, in this uh, kind of scenario where you, you have you know, arbitrarily complicated neural network, but somehow because it's a composition of matrix multiplication and nonlinearities, uh, you can uh, see that there are structure behind each of the vectors. They, they, they are random vectors with roughly ID entries. And if you, uh, you know, pay close attention to the examples before, you can figure out a general rule for tracking how these vectors evolve over the course of this computation. So in particular, for every vector V uh, in this computation, you can associate a random variable. I'm just gonna write this as ket, V ket using quantum notation. Uh, and and the, the point here is that as n goes to infinity, 
these entries will look like ID samples from this random variable, vcat. And the rules in which uh, you can calculate this uh, random variable vcat is you know, pretty straightforward in the case of nonlinearity. So you know, the cat of phi of v is just phi of the cat of v. This is very obvious. And then for a matrix multiplication where w is an ID random matrix, with uh, variance one over n, uh, the way you calculate the cat of w times v is writing it as, as a sum of two terms, the, a hat cat and a dot cat. So the, the first term, the hat cat, is a Gaussian term, which is you know reminiscent uh, of the example we saw in the very beginning of matrix multiplication with a uh, uncorrelated vector. Um, and this is essentially what you expect if you uh, assume V and W are independent. But of course, in general, V and W are correlated. So the second term, this uh, dot cat, is there to capture this correlation. So this is, has a you know, somewhat complicated formula, but it really says something pretty simple, uh, which is that you know, if the, this term is equal to a linear combination of previous uh, cats. And the, the weights of linear combinations equal to the expectation of uh, some kind of like random variable derivative. Like, you know, if you know Marian von calculus is somewhat reminiscent of that, uh, of dv over um, the hat cat of w transpose times u. So I don't expect you to like really grok this formula uh, on the first go, but let me just kind of recall the example from earlier where uh, we saw that when you know v is correlated with uh, w in the simplest way, then we have you know wv is equal to some constant multiple of u plus a Gaussian term. So this Gaussian term corresponds to the hat cat, and then the this uh, uh, constant times u term corresponds to uh, this dot cat, right? Because like here you can see that you know. If, if there's only one term in the linear combination, you just have some constant times the cat of u. Okay. Again, you know, I don't expect you know people to really get this in the first go, but I just want to convey some of the general structure here uh, when you try to do this calculation. Exact equality. Exact equality. Yeah. So it's, again, like the way you should interpret these cats is that when n goes to infinity. Um, like the, 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 the vectors will have ID entries, um, but like you know, the, uh, the corresponding entries of different vectors will still correlate. And these random variables track those, the, the random correlation structure of these vectors, the entries of vectors. Okay, so you know, maybe all this discuss, discussion of neural network is a bit foreign to this audience. So let's look at some consequences in uh, random matrix theory. So the first, you know, we can do is just recovering some, you know, classical random matrix laws. And the way this goes is, is uh, you know, essentially any uh, moment calculation we do in classical random matrix theory, you know, via some kind of trace calculation, you know, is, is captured by this kind of, uh, you know, expectation where, you know, the trace of M, any matrix M is equal to you know the expectation of z transpose times m times z, where z is you know independently sampled as a standard Gaussian, right? Or any any vari random variable with variance one. So this is completely trivial, but this allows us to reduce any trace computation uh, into a, 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 a kind of neural network computation, uh, uh, and uh, recover you know what what is known in the classical world. So for example, here's, the how, how, here's how you would try to recover our single pasture law. So you know, let's say like W is an ID Gaussian matrix. It doesn't have to be Gaussian, but you know, let's just say this is Gaussian for now. And you want to compute its singular value distribution. You know, like, and this of course reduces to moment computations um, of this form. So if you want to recover uh, this moment calculation, uh, from the principles that I just outlined, the calculation, the, the methods of calculation I just outlined, what you would do is you sample z 
uh, you know, essentially the same z here from a, from a standard Gaussian vector independently from w, and you use the rules that I outlined earlier to figure out what this w transpose w to the kth power times z looks like, okay? So, you know, you, so you essentially you would just apply these rules to find out what the distribution of these vectors w times z, w transpose times w times z, and so on and so on, uh, what these vectors look like. So eventually you can do this inductive calculation. You can conclude that uh, this, this, uh, this vector will look like some multiple of z and the multiple being rho k, the, the two kth moment of the marginal pressure distribution plus some other stuff. These are other vectors which turns out not to really matter in the eventual calculation of the trace because these stuff uh, will be independent from z. So as a result, when you uh, do the trace calculation, the normalized trace calculation, you just get that, you know, this thing uh, equals, well, so you expand this using this, uh, this rule. So you get, you know, z transpose times n times z, and then, and then n times z is equal to rho k of z plus stuff. And then because of independence of z and stuff, you just get this rho k, you know, times z transpose z divided by n, and then this thing converges to one by a lot of large numbers, so you recover the, the correct moment uh, of Martian angle pasture. Okay, so hopefully that was an uh, illustrating example. Um, and you can see that, you know, like for essentially any moment calculation you can do using free probability, you can do uh, the same thing here. Okay, so, so that's the kind of like the first uh, thing you can say about uh, classical uh, random matrix theory. But some new, something new we can say here is what's called the neural uh, free independence principle. And the statement is very simple. What it says is that, you know, suppose you look at a neural network or any kind of computation composed of the uh, interleaving of matrix multiplication and initialized nonlinearities, then on the left side, you can first form the algebra of diagonal matrices formed from the activation vectors. Like, you know, all these vectors here, you can form the algebra of diagonal matrices. On the right side, you can look at the, you know, the, 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 the algebra generated by uh, the weight uh, matrices. So, you know, like here W1, W2 can be correlated or they cannot be correlated, it doesn't really matter. And the claim here is that these two collections uh, are freely independent. Okay, so depending on where you're coming from, this could be like very surprising or not surprising at all. So the, the reason it, it probably is very surprising initially is because these vectors are computed from the Ws in the first place. So, you know, like the green, the green vectors literally W1 times the input and, and so on and so forth with the other vectors. So there obviously are, you know, potentially strong correlation between uh, these vectors and the wave matrices. But somehow when you let the, uh, the vector size go to infinity, the correlation between the wave matrices and uh, the vectors actually vanish well, insofar as free, free independence is considered between the algebra of diagonal matrices and the weight matrices. Okay, so, um, so this fact uh, can be very useful for uh, calculating certain things. For example, you know, if you want to look at a random neural network and you want to look at you know, the, the Jacobian of the random ne neural network, which is a matrix, a random ensemble, then the calculation of the spectrum of this thing, you know, is a priori pretty complicated because you have like, like really, you know, potentially very strong correlations between the different usages of a wave matrix during the forward pass and then the gradient back propagation. But using this fact, you can essentially decompose the, you know, for example, this neural network you can decompose the Jacobian into a product of freely independent matrices. And then you can just solve it using classical methods like you know, S-transform if you want. Okay, so, so that was you know, two things to talk about, you know, recovering 
uh, classical free probability calculations and this neural free independent uh, independence principle, these are some uh, two, two examples of consequences of this tensor program framework uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of relatively traditional setting of you know, random matrices, uh, spectrum, and so on and so forth. So let me zoom out a little bit to, to look at I mean, some, some of the philosophical points here. So of course, first, you know, without the, if you look at tensor programs without this entry-wise nonlinearity, essentially you just have linear algebra. And, and in that sense, it's, you know, like nothing really different from traditional random matrix theory or free probability. But once you add nonlinearities, the, the, you really, they, they really force you to take a different perspective philosophically. So, you know, for one, in a linear case, much of the property of an operator is captured by the spectrum or the, the algebra containing it. Uh, but in the nonlinear case, there's no spectrum and there's no like a nice algebra to speak of. So you, like, you don't really have too many tools from the traditional perspective. So as a result, you have to keep track explicitly how the operators act on vectors. So you know, so instead of you know being able to extract away the underlying Hilbert space in the in the classical uh, case, you really have to keep track of how they interact. So now you have like two sorts of things kind of in a single algebra or single object, and you have to keep track of how they interact. And the second thing, which is I mentioned Dimitri earlier, is that when you add these coordinate-wise nonlinearities, now you have a preferred basis. So you cannot do basis-free calculation. But this is, turns out not to be like a really a drag because essentially because of these preferred basis, you have this um, like this ID expression for things. And that, that still makes things quite tractable. So, so in this sense, you can think of like tensor programs as some some nonlinear generalization of free probability. So it's like a set of calculation tools that allows you to do the relevant calculations uh, for these nonlinear random matrices, if you want, or neural networks, as the the size of the network goes to infinity, which is you know which just generalizes the 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 way free probability does calculation for very large random matrices. Okay, so now let's talk about um, why this set of tools is unreasonably effective in AI. So now we're, we're coming to a set of questions that may be like a bit foreign to you know, people who are very well versed in, in the classical random matrix theory. Here we're gonna ask a slightly different set of questions. They're related to the, to the old questions in the, in the linear case, but um, they're gonna be different in some important ways. So first of all, you know, in the linear case, um, we often are asking questions about the spectrum, just about the random matrix itself. Here in you know, deep learning neural networks, we have something a bit more. Even if you, you know, look at a linear neural network, you still want to learn the network, uh, learn some pattern from data. So you have like a data source. And you also have an algorithm to uh, to do this learning. And this is usually some form of gradient descent. So let me just briefly uh, recap what gradient descent means. So in the context of neural network, your objective is to kind of fiddle with the weights, the weight values of the matrices so that you minimize the, the amount of errors you make on a, on a data set, like a demonstration data set, okay? So, you know, like, so in this picture, you have the weight space on the x-axis, which of course is in general very, very high dimensional space, not just a one dimensional picture like this. Y-axis, you have errors. And the objective uh, you have is to minimize the number of mis mistakes by fiddling with the weights, right? And so like um, at each step, essentially you, 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 you look at the gradient of this error function on the y-axis against the weights, and you move the weights in, in that direction to move down the hill, okay? So that's why it's called gradient descent. And eventually when you do it enough times, you're gonna land in the minimum of, the, of this 
error landscape and you have like kind of learned the pattern, so to speak. So here there are two very important hyperparameters, which you know in in maybe like the convex case is not like too big of a deal, but in, in this case, in the neural network case, we're dealing with something that's highly non-convex, does not really have any guarantees of convergence. And so there's a lot of sensitivity to these two hyperparameters. So these two hyperparameters are the initialization, i.e., where do you start in this optimization process? So you know you could start here, which which is far away from the you know the global minimum, or maybe if you're lucky, you can start here, and then you don't have to do so much to converge. So that's the first hyperparameter, the initialization, and then the second hyperparameter is the learning rate, which is the how how large a step do you need to take. Uh, at, at each iteration. So here the trade-off is that, you know, if you take a very large step, then like potentially you can converge, you know, very quickly versus a very small step, you know, you might take a long time. But if you take a very, very large step, you might like kind of just diverge. You, there can be like um, a dynamics for you to kind of bounce out of this valley, right? So you can imagine in this picture, if you take a very large step, you will bounce out of the valley very quickly. So there's a, there's a trade-off here. And um, a priori, it's not so easy to tell what is the right value to set for these two hyperparameters. So, like take this you know example of a neural network we've seen many times already. In real you know, deep learning as practiced today, the million dollar question, or even maybe ten million or hundred million dollar question, is how do you set these hyperparameters? The initialization and the learning rate. In particular, you can, you can do so for every single weight matrix here. So this is a very high dimensional set of numbers. You have to know how to set. In practice, uh, when we talk about initialization of a neural network, we usually you know, randomly sample the weights, kind of like in the first part of the talk where we talk about random neural networks. So we randomly sample the weights, and now the initial, initialization question is actually how to set the scale of this random initialization, of, the, of this random sampling. Okay, so again, this is the, the million or 10 million or 100 million dollar question is how do you set these hyperparameters? $64 question? Okay, I mean, that's, that's the arbitrage opportunity. Um, so, okay, so, so this question is very, very hard to answer. And you, you cannot really hope to give a you know, theoretically motivated you know, answer to this, uh, definitive answer to this question. So we can ask an even more basic question, which is how do you scale them? How do you scale them as the size of the network becomes large? Okay, so, so to really convey what the point of this question is, let's look at some simple examples. Okay, so now we're kind of like taking a step back from the neural network context, just looking at simple examples. So if you have random variables, Z1, Z2, and so on and so forth, sample ID from a Gaussian with mean one and variance one, okay, then I, I want to ask you, like, how should you scale this sum of the Z alphas from one to N, where you multiply it by this one over N to the R power? Well, if you, if you think about the sum as a function r, like here's a basic picture. If, if r is too large, then this normalized sum will just go to zero as n goes to infinity. If it's too small, then the sum will, will blow up to infinity. So essentially, like you know, by law of large number, the only thing that makes sense is when r equals one, or you just take the simple average, okay? So this, you know, this, this should be very intuitive. On the other hand, if there's no mean here, it's just a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one, then you know the, the, the similar picture still applies, but now the, the transition point, the critical point is R equals one half, where you get central limit theorem, okay? So, so, so both of these are examples of questions about how do you scale an object? The object here being the sum of these ID elements. Again, like these are examples of, of questions of how do you scale sums. 
Now, in the neural network case, we're faced with something far more complicated. We're asking, OK, let's sample the weights, you know, ID from, say, some Gaussian with variance n to the negative bi power and uh, has learning rate n to the negative ci power, where i is the layer index. So this is like a large number of um, possibilities. Now classify the trained neural network as a function of these exponents b1, c1, b2, c2, so on and so forth. Right, so this is like a far more complicated uh, question that, you, okay, first of all, like we, we, maybe some of us just only saw neural networks today, and now you're faced with this question, what do you do? I mean, maybe you just sweat and shrug it off. Um, but again, the, this, this question, the reason this is hard is, is multiple fold. One is that we're asking question about after training. So, so training, you remember, it starts with random neural network, and then you, you start doing gradient descent uh, on this. So at the end of training, at the end of this gradient descent procedure, the weights will not be ID random. So you cannot just assume that, you know, like the, the, all the calculations we did in the first part of talk about random neural network will apply to the end of training because it will look nothing alike. So that's the first point of difficulty. The second point of difficulty is that this whole training procedure depends on the data you use. You know, if, for example, we can train on only cats and dogs. That will give you some kind of neural network. You can train on like all of the Instagram images. That will give you some other kind of neural network. You can train on you know, all the human text on the internet. That will give you some other kind of neural network. So the resulting neural network very much depends on the data used. And this dependence can be very complex. And you might not even you know, have any way of hoping to get any kind of insight from this procedure. Now, miraculously, actually, this is all like not insurmountable difficulties, and it can be solved. So, for one, like this, this um, uh, the, the 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 hardness of dealing with non-IED random weights, or other weights after training, is that instead of looking at the neural network as if as approximation of random neural network, you want to recontextualize this whole thing by observing that in the first, the first part of the talk, the only insights we used were that you know the computation of neural network is a composition of matrix multiplication and corner-wise nonlinearities. And second, and here I'm skipping over you know some some amount of insight. The second is that we, if you look at the whole gradient descent procedure, the whole training procedure of a neural network, then this whole procedure is in fact a composition of matrix multiplication and corner-wise nonlinearities. So everything, all the building blocks that we talked about in the first part of talk about random neural networks also applies to the computation that starts with a random neural network and start doing gradient descent. So, so, but just here you have more steps from the random neutralization to the end of training. But, but the point remains that the same building blocks that we talked about in the first part, first part talk can be applied to the second part. It just, you're just dealing with the more complicated computation graph, but it's, it's just the same procedure. You can do the same kind of inductive calculation to handle this case. So you can crank the machinery and do the hard calculation, and you find that, in fact, there is a universal classification regardless of the data. And this is kind of like a, you know, a situation where we got lucky that there is not a heavy dependence on the data in this kind of classification. So here you can think of this as you know, some sort of universality, just like you know, in central limit theorem where you know, well, a large number, there's some kind of universality going on where you don't care what the actual distribution of the ID um, entries are. So let me just briefly give you um, a, a picture of this classification uh, of infinite infinitely wide neural networks. Um, again, this is kind of akin to the classification of what, like how do you normalize a sum when, when the sum is a sum of ID elements with zero mean, right? But this is like a far more complicated, far higher dimensional picture. So in short, you know, you also have this unstable trivial 
phenomenon where you know the neural network would just blow up you know the the output of network goes to infinity or output network you know go to zero and, and does not respond to data so these are unstable or trivial phenomena which is similar to you know like the the, the thing we looked at before with low large number and central limit theorem so these are bad now outside of this bad region there's an island in the middle which uh, you know doesn't face either of these catastrophes, uh, and in fact, like the math is actually kind of nice in the sense that the neural network, albeit very complicated, in a, in its finite form, actually converges uh, to have a, di a training dynamics which is linear. So it's like a linear differential equation that governs its evolution. Uh, so it's very attractive mathematically, but unfortunately, it doesn't do something we really care about. Uh, in learning, which is learning representations of the data, learning features of data. So for example, you know, when you learn over many images, you, you hope that you pick up some feature like you know, the presence of a human in a picture or not. That's usually corresponds to a neuron after learning. But here, essentially, there's no such feature learning going on. You will like, never be able to pick up, you know, like the neurons will never be able to pick up you know, certain uh, um, relevant features like the presence of eye or plants, you know, or horses, and stuff like that. So this is actually also very bad. Now, if you squint your eyes, there's like the upper border here, uh, which actually does feature learning. And furthermore, if you squint closely, this, there's like a, a single point in this picture that is kind of maximally feature learning in some sense. And so in summary, what this picture tells you is that, okay, there's a high dimensional possibility about how you scale a neural network, you know, which is like a very high dimensional generalization of how you scale a sum in low or large numbers. And there are like, you know, there are some, like there are some scaling that are obviously bad. Some scalings are not obviously bad, but still bad. And there's one single choice that is like optimal in some sense. That gives you like kind of the most non-trivial behavior. Okay, so what is the takeaway here? The neural network, you know, as as we uh, talk about today, like you know, ChatGPT or Quark, they will get bigger and bigger every year, and and you hope that they will get smarter as they get bigger. But this is only true if you scale them correctly. So naive scaling of initialization and learning rate leads to cat catastrophe as size goes to infinity, while doing the right mathematics allows you to foresee and avoid the catastrophe. So you can make an analogy to, you know, let's say you're NASA, you're trying to shoot rockets to the moon, okay? But you don't know Newton's law. So you know it's like something like m1 times m2 divided by some power of r times some constant. Okay, but you don't know. Okay, so like, okay, might as well just see, shoot your shot and see what sticks. So you might guess, you know, like, you know, it's like R to the third power or something like that in the bottom. And then you, you, you know, finagle with some constants to make the data fit on Earth. But obviously it doesn't work because that's not the right power of R. And try again, it's not the right power R. And you can, you know, sacrifice many lives and a lot of rockets until you finally land on the moon. And this is a situation really like that's not too far from how things were done only recently. So shooting rockets to the moon is kind of like these training runs of these large language models. And they can take months to finish. So you really want to know ahead of time like you're going to succeed or not. Otherwise, you're consuming you know, millions, tens of millions, hundred million dollars for fail uh, runs. And these kind of Newton's constant in this case is kind of like these hyperparameters, like learning rate initialization, and these, you know, the B prime or B prime prime, these are the scaling exponents. And, you know, when you're doing experiments on Earth, you can like, you know, always kind of figure with these uh, numbers to make thing, uh, things fit on your data. But when you try to extrapolate all the way to the moon, you really have to be very accurate. And you cannot just rely on like, you know, plain empiricism. To, to get these numbers correct. And in this sense, you know, like doing the right mathematics, in this case, you know, using tensor grams to find the, the right limits of neural network really help us find the right universal law of gravitation or whatever. 
for neural network. Because now we can extrapolate um, your insights about small neural networks to very large neural networks so that you don't you know, face catastrophe when you try to scale. So it should be this way? OK, OK. Um, all right, so let me conclude. So uh, here I gave a very brief introduction to the theory of tensor programs. And here there are really just two takeaways or insights. The first is that um, it turns out that all deep learning computation is a composition of two building blocks. One is a matrix multiplication, matrix multiplication and the other one is corner-wise nonlinearities, and they're interleaved in potentially very complicated ways. But somehow it's kind of like, you know, how, you know, Church and Turing came up with, you know, Turing machine and asserted that they're universal for, you know, feasible comp computation. Here's like a similar phenomenon going on where, you know, deep learning is, is formed organically from, you know, the availability of GPUs and um, prior work on neural networks. But somehow they can be captured using these two operations. And that's it. And then the second insight is that any kind of computation using only these two building blocks can be reasoned effectively. Um, and, and we can conclude that like the vectors from, the, from these computations have roughly ID entries, and we can track how these distributions evolve over the course of this computation. Now, just like in physics, we have fundamental forces like gravity, EM, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear force. Oops. And we have you know, very successful theories about them that are celebrated today, like the standard model and relativity. And just like how we don't have the theory of everything yet, we're at a similar state in deep learning where we also have fundamental forces like width, the number of neurons in a layer, depth, which is the number of layers in the network, training time, how long you train the network, and you know, many other um, scaling dimensions that I haven't talked about. And in this talk, I talk about this, uh, this framework called tensor programs that allows you to reason essentially as satisfactorily as possible about large width neural networks. But really like this, this question of how do we build the, the smartest you know, entities out there that will still have you know, a lot of um, things to expect from theories regarding these other dimensions, which are study, studied far less than the large width case. And in fact, you know, they probably can be unified in some way, just like how you know, uh, Faraday and um, Maxwell were able to unify electricity and magnetism. So right now is the right time for a search for a theory of everything for large scale deep learning, where we really understand how these networks behave as you scale them to infinity in these different notions of size. Now, as a mathematician, like the, this is a very appealing problem because this is, these are about you know, fundamental notions of limits and it's all about classifying all possible limits and finding the optimal limit. And I really cannot, you know, really cannot understate this enough that this is a very rare situation where literally any advance you make in these problems can be shipped into like the next large language model run, training run. It's like you, you literally have a direct impact. You have a, you have a lever at your hand you know, to, to, to change the future of humanity or something. I mean, like, I think it's, 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 it's quite, you know, I think it's a quite, quite rare uh, situation. And, um, you know, I, I'm kind of lucky to be here to be witnessing uh, this aspect uh, of, you know, history of intelligence and maybe history of humanity. But, um, uh, yeah, so this is, you know, I, I don't, I think this is like, sounds like a joke, but it's like, is I cannot understate this. No. Okay, so, but if this sounds like too lofty for you, uh, then let me just conclude by saying that the other main way mathematicians can contribute to AI development today is to teach AI mathematics. Just like how you would teach 
uh, a bright, rapidly improving student. And this is more so that any improvement will be felt by millions to billions of people in the very, very near future. So um, it's kind of like, you know, you, like think back to the old days, you know, like Alexander the Great. Like he was tutored by Aristotle. Like you being in the shoes of Aristotle, uh, tutoring like one of the best of the world, in a sense. And in turn, like these improvements will allow you to accelerate your you know, frontier mathematics research because you know, they will serve as AI collaborators brainstorming and writing out papers for you. So um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think everybody here probably hates writing papers. I don't know, maybe Jamie, you would beg to disagree, but, <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, you know, as, you, as you teach um, these AI systems, they will kind of act like grad students or postdocs or collaborators who will kind of take up some of the, the work for you. And uh, as such, this will become one of the highest paying jobs in the coming years. And this will you know, involve both informal and formal mathematics. So anyway, so let me know if this sounds interesting to you. Now, either way it works, you can solve the theory everything or you can tutor mathematics. All right, I'll end here, thank you. Thank you.